Africa. Uh, we leave tomorrow. We'll be there for 12 days. I will only miss one Sunday. Look at your neighbor and say one Sunday. And we do have some really special things um, planned on those Wednesday nights as well. Um, many of you have met Dr. Megan Musi, the, the I call her the new Old Testament professor at Southeastern. And uh, she's part of our church, and she'll be sharing this Wednesday night. Steve Chase will be sharing the, the next Wednesday night. Pastor Paul will be preaching um, next week. And I know there are some of you who, who like him better than you like me, so you can't stay home. And um, so anyway, so things are going to be well taken care of. Somebody say amen. We start a new Christmas series next week called Unwrapped. And you want to come and figure the, the platform per usual will be transformed. And um, so I, I want you to come to church. Okay, here's the other thing I'm going to do. Because I'm going to be watching from South Africa, and I'm going to ask them to pan the crowd. How's that? Okay, so. But, um, and I, I would like to say a very special thank you to um, all of those who helped uh, decorate uh, the church for Christmas. It looks fabulous. I especially want to give a shout out to uh, Debbie Roberts uh, with an assist from Ernie. Um, here's what you have to do when you come in. Okay, when you, when you come in the lobby now, you have to look up to the hills where your help comes from. If you look up on the balcony, you'll see this beautiful Christmas tree made of, made of wreaths. Um, De Debbie went on a recycling project for us. We, we've, uh, the whole time I've been here, when we get ready to drag everything out for Christmas, we have, a, we have 12 or 14 beautiful, good-sized wreaths that, that weren't being of use. So she refurbished them and and made them look beautiful again, gave them new life, blew the dust off of them, and um, they're up there, and I want you to enjoy that on your way, but you have to, but you have to look up and, uh, in order to see it. Thank you, and, and all of you. Um, I'm going to get in trouble now, but um, Gwen Newell's involved in that process, and of course, Sherry Vickers. And, and I didn't see you out there, Patty. Patty works really hard around here, so let's clap again okay we're in week three of grateful I'm so excited about the title of my message the title of my message is grateful and you see that the full is finally up there aren't you glad there's no more Tetris boxes and it's all totally full we just messed with your head for four weeks it was so much fun <laughs> but anyway it's a beautiful set and um, but the title of my message today is grateful for leftovers amen now next week you'll be tired of leftovers but this week we still like them amen and um but there's a there's a passage of scripture that i think will that i think will will help us um we are since we're since we're leaving uh tomorrow we gotta we gotta hurry up meet it all because it won't and it'll probably still be in the fridge when we get back okay um, John chapter 6 verse 1 are you there okay then just look up there after this Jesus crossed over the sea of Galilee also known as the sea of Tiberias and a huge crowd many of them pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem for the annual Passover celebration were following him wherever he went to watch him heal the sick so when Jesus went up into the hills and sat down with his disciples around him he soon saw a great multitude of people climbing the hill looking for him Turning to Philip, he asked, Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, it would take a fortune to begin to do it. Then Andrew Simon's, Simon Peter's brother spoke up. There's a youngster here with five barley loaves and a couple of fish. But what good is that with all this mob? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus ordered. And all of them, the approximate count of the men was only 5,000, sat down on the grassy slopes. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and passed them out to the people afterwards. He did the same with the fish, and everyone ate until full. Everybody say full. It's right up there. Yeah. Now gather the scraps, Jesus told his disciples, so that nothing is wasted. And 12 baskets were filled with the leftovers amen now this is one of <clears throat> there there are 
there are two stories that are recorded in all four Gospels. This one and the story of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Okay, so um, this must be a pretty important story. This must be a, an, an incident that the Holy Spirit really desired all of the gospel writers to capture all from different perspectives. And I, won't, I will mention some of the, some of the other verses, but, I, but I, I'll spare you reading um, the account from all four gospels. They're, they're very similar, just with, it, with, a couple of, with a couple of tweaks. And, you know, I noticed something this week as I was studying that I'd never quite seen before. Do you have a friend who, whenever you ask them a question, they never quite answer the question? They just tell you what they want to tell you, and they don't answer the question. Well, don't point at anybody. But, but he, so here's what, here's what happened. Okay, so when this, when this mob is, is coming, this large crowd is coming, and Jesus asked, he asked the question. Now look at his question. When he turned to Philip, he asked Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Do you, do you see what Philip's answer was? Philip didn't answer the question. He didn't tell Jesus, you know, where the Sam's Club was. He, he didn't tell him that. He said, his answer was, it would take a fortune to begin to do that. In other translations, he talks about how much denarii and how many, but somewhere between eight and 12 months of, of wages it would take. It would take an, an enormous amount Biblical accounts are somewhere between fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars to to take care of of all of this. So he was he immediately his mind went to we we don't have enough money to do that. It's immediately where his mind went. The question Jesus asked Philip was, "Where could we buy enough food to feed twenty thousand people?" For those of you who fed 40 at your house this week, you're a little bit freaked out, but that's a lot of people, okay? That's, a, that's a, a lot of people. And most, most, common, most commentators don't give a lot of information about, you know, how many people could have been fed, but I'm, but I'm confident there was not anywhere out there in that remote area that had 20,000 people pieces of bread ready for this event. So Philip ignored the question and went straight to, we don't have enough money. The question was not how much money do we need. The, the correct answer would have, would have been, well, there's not anywhere that we can get that much bread in this area. So here's, here's what I believe that the principle is from, from this exchange. The principle is, even if we have a ton of money, that doesn't solve all our problems. Because you could have thrown all the money you had at it, and that was not going to fix it because the bread was just not available. Now, I know a couple of weeks ago, the lottery got up over a billion, I think close to a billion and a half, was enough to even tempt a preacher. I did not succumb. Or I wouldn't be here this... No, kidding, kidding. So, um, so <clears throat> the National Endowment for Financial Education reports that 70% of lottery winners, they... Uh, surveyed those over a million dollars 70 percent of lottery winners will go bankrupt okay largely it's because they don't know how to control money that's why they're playing the lottery and a lot of their friends and families have have demands on their money okay so if i ever fall into temptation to win the lottery don't come asking me for money okay 
can't believe he said that in church. Just kidding. Okay. In examining the enormity of the issue, we see Philip give the problem back to Jesus. Because we, we just, Jesus, we can't, we can't do this. So the answer to the question of where do we get the bread is, is helped to be, to be answered from Andrew's solution. Immediately, Andrew says, we have this boy. He's got a little food. It's not enough to feed all these mob, but, but we do have some resources. So when Philip says, we can't afford this, Andrew says, we can't afford this. I'm sure he agrees. He said, but we will give you what little bit we have. Jesus, we are willing to give away what we have and put it in your hand. We will do that. And I think that's where we see the miracle because the answer to the question, where will we get enough bread for all these people? Aren't you glad that they were talking to the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who turned water into wine, the one who walked on water, the one who healed the sick, the one who raised the dead? That's who the, the answer to where will we get enough to take care of an impossible situation? The answer is from the Son of God. The answer is from Jesus himself. The answer is from the one who loved us and gave himself for us. That's the answer. So Andrew's solution was to take what small amount they had and give it to Jesus and see what he could do barley loaves and a few small fish most commentators believe we're dealing with sardines I, how many of you like anchovies on your pizza well thank god there's not any in here because i had to tell you what when i worked at pizza hut it was back in the days before we wore gloves Somebody wanted anchovies on. I'd have to reach in that. And, oh, okay, I'm moving on. He brought barley loaves and a little. Okay, now, here's what we know a little bit we know about barley loaves. <clears throat> barley bore only about one third of the value of wheat loaves in that time and place. It was, it was coarser, it was the cheapest bread you could, you could buy. How many of you know what a day-old bread store is? Raise your hand high in the air. Okay, I don't, I don't see them anymore very much. But when I was growing up, that's the only place we, brought, we bought our bread was at the day-old bread store. So much like the, the cheap bread here, that's what I was raised on. There was only one redeeming factor about going into the day old bread store. It was Wonder Bread made by Hostess. So all the stale Twinkie, Susie Q's, and Ding Dongs you could eat were in there. Come on, somebody. And they're cheap. Mama would buy them if they were cheap. Are you feeling me now? I thought you would. There are there are three principles I want to show you from this passage. The first one is give it up. Bring what you have to Jesus. Everybody say give it up. Amen. You know it's not enough. But when you place it in the hands of Jesus, you can be confident that he can take care of it. Your life, your future, your family, your survival, your money. Put it in the hands of Jesus and watch what, what he will do. Place it in his hands. Give it up. You know, throughout this, this story and the other accounts of this story, one of the, the really exciting things that's, that's going to, to happen is that the disciples get to be a part of the story. And the, and the first way is, is to not hold on to it. Proverbs 11.24 says, There is that which scattereth, but yet increaseth. And he who holds on to it, tends to poverty okay so so what happens is is when we have a 
a white knuckled grip on our resources and don't understand the principles of generosity from the word, it, it goes the other way. Do you see how that the principles of the word of God are counterintuitive to the way we do things? Because he said, if you scatter it, it will increase. Okay, everybody say scatter. Everybody say, I'm awake. It's whatever that chemical is in the turkey. That's what I'm worried about is making you sleepy. Because I know some of you had turkey for breakfast. I ain't lying. Okay. Scattered is it's an agrarian term. has to do with the scattering of seed. So we all know that that, that principle is true. The principle of sowing and reaping is that when you, when you scatter it, when you toss it, when you, when you sow it in the ground, then when you come back, and aren't you excited to see the strawberries coming up out the ground? Here, there it comes. The, the seed was planted, and, and now the, the crop will grow. That same principle is true in, in our life, and not just about money, but who we are and all that we do when we learn to, to give it up to give it away, to be generous like the Lord taught us who sent His only Son. He taught us about giving from the very beginning. As we move into the Christmas season, Jesus, uh, the Lord taught us about giving through Jesus. Second thing that I want to say to you this morning is to give in. Give it up. And now I want you to give in. I want you to position yourself to receive. John... 610 says, tell everyone to sit down, Jesus ordered, and, and all of them, the approximate count of the men only was 5,000 sat down on the grassy slopes. <clears throat> Mark 640 says, so they sat down in, in groups of hundreds and fifties. So they were getting ready for the picnic. So the, the principle in this passage is that there is an obedience that must take place in our lives before the miracle and the provision happens. Okay. He told them to sit down in these groups like they were going to get to eat. The, you said, well, how do you know that? I'm glad you asked. Because this word to sit down in, in the Greek signifies the reclining position which was the position with which they they ate and so it's it's preparation to eat so he says sit down get ready to eat so it's much like if your wife says okay everybody come to the table you don't smell anything there's nothing in the fridge Nobody has ordered anything because you're outside of Domino's delivery area, which is something you should check before you buy a house. Don't smell anything, see anything, but go sit down. I don't know about you, but I'm not about that. This is what they were asked to do. They were asked to go and sit down. So the sequence was, was not that the food is here and this is a nice spot for a picnic so we're going to go ahead and feed you. The sequence is sit down and get ready to eat even though you can't see where the food is coming from. Because I don't care how thin you slice that, that bread or those little fishies. That's not going to be enough for everybody. Now here's the sad truth. It's very possible that it could have been enough for the disciples and their inner circle had they decided to hold on to it. How many of you are glad they didn't decide to hold on to it? But they gave it to Jesus. And when they gave it to Jesus, something powerful happened. Obey God first. Put yourself in a position where you can receive. Put yourself in a position of faith that says as bad as this looks, as impossible as this looked to those disciples, it was going to cost a fortune. There wasn't anywhere you could go and pick it up. There's really not any way this could happen. But here's what they forgot. They forgot that Jesus was with them. And as long as Jesus is with us, how many of you know it's going to be okay? In the Assemblies of God, one of our most well-known, famous, if you will, 
missionaries. In, fa in fact, in, in, re in research, um, I discovered that December 19th in the Episcopal Anglican Church is Lillian Thrasher Day. They have made her a saint. The message board was really funny because they couldn't figure out how an Assembly of God person got to be an Episcopal saint. She was a missionary in Egypt. She spent from 1911 to 1961 with out of furlough. She worked there in an orphanage. In, and she was there during the Nazi occupation during World War II. When she died in 1961, she was known as the mother of the Nile and had cared for over 25,000 Egyptian children. Her orphanage remains open today. Lillian knew the power of God's faithfulness. During World War II, those war shortages meant that clothing and food were in short supply. Children's clothes were worn beyond repair and bed sheets and towels were full of holes. International mail delivery had been suspended due to the war and she was cut off from the bulk of her funding. Donations that arrived by mail from all over the world suddenly ceased. The situation became desperate. Lillian knew the power of prayer. After rationing food for days trying to make it last, one morning, she passed around a note calling the children and the women to pray. The note read, we have nothing. It's the part of this story that, that got me as compared to the Bible story. Lillian said out loud, wrote it down, we have nothing. The need is very great indeed, but our God is greater. Ask and it shall be given. They continued to pray through Monday and Tuesday. On Wednesday morning, Lillian received a summons from the American ambassador, Alexander Kirk, to come to Cairo. Upon her arrival, he greeted her with news. A Red Cross ship full of relief supplies bound for German-controlled Greece had been captured by the British. The ship had been ordered to dump all her cargo and return home. A Scottish soldier on board knew of the Lillian Trasher orphanage and convinced the British captain to unload the supplies in Alexandria. Ambassador Kirk asked Lillian if she could use the contents, which included 2,600 dresses, 1,900 handmade sweaters, 1,009 pairs of boys' pants, 3,800 blankets, 1,100 towels, seven kegs of powdered milk, and 1,200 sacks of rice. She said yes. Two days later, a convoy delivered the entire cargo down the Nile with enough supplies to last for the rest of the, the war. God had answered the prayer of Lillian and the children beyond anything they could have ever asked or imagined. Aren't you thankful for God's supply? That same powerful, come on, give him some praise in his house today. That same powerful God is available to you today. I said that same powerful God is available to you today. Here's, here's the third thing that I want to tell you this morning. I want you to give it up. I want you to give in to whatever God tells you to do. And I want you to give it away. I want you to be involved in giving away the blessing. I want you to be involved in giving away the blessing. John 6, 11 says, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, passed them out to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish and everyone ate until full. Now, the gospels tell things from different perspectives. I want you to see what, what Matthew and the other two writers, the way they record this verse. And I'll read it to you from Matthew. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Jesus' delivery method of getting the food to the people in the groups of 50 was to use the 12. Okay? So as he blessed it and, and broke it, I, I don't know. I don't know how exactly how it happened or what it looked like. There's, 
you know, there's speculation on, on how it happened or what it looked like. But all I know is that he filled baskets and filled baskets until everyone was full. The joy of serving Jesus is being able to give away the only thing that satisfies the hunger of the soul of man. And that's the bread of life. So, so this is their, this was their opportunity. This is our opportunity. This is our moment to give away what people need the most. And that's Jesus. It's the only thing that satisfies that void and that hole in man. And that's Jesus. What I love here is that everyone ate until they were full. Okay. So let's go back to the beginning. Where, where they are, there's this large crowd. We don't have enough money. We don't have a place where we can find this much food. We don't know what we're going to do. It's kind of a desperate situation. And just a few moments later, the situation is everybody is full. Everybody is full. So my challenge to, to you today in this place is twofold. First, if you're here and you're empty, Jesus wants to fill you with the bread of life. Amen. And if you know anybody who's hungry, Jesus wants us to lead them to where the supply of bread doesn't run out. That's what God has called us to do. It's the reason the church exists. It's the reason for the parade outreach. Pastor, why are we doing that? That's a good question. I'm glad you ask. We are in the town that loves parades more than they love anything else. And we are, sla it doesn't matter whether you go, where the parade goes that way or the parade goes that way. We're almost slap dab right in the middle. And we've got this big parking lot and all this space out, out front. We've got, we've got restrooms that, that we, can, we can use and we just want to pass out cocoa and, and be a blessing. Because I, I will tell you the truth. If you've ever taken small children to the parade, that lasts for eternity. And they're not leaving because they're going to get candy. So if you're here in the middle of the parade, where are you going to go to the bathroom? Right here, Bartow First, 1950 South Broadway at the corner of Broadway and Hooker. It's just a small way. We've got some other things um, that, we're trying to, that we're trying to pull off um, as, as well, and we'll share more about those. But it's just a simple way to say to our community, we love you. We care, we care about you. And that's the reputation that we build in, in our community. A, a lady called and asked what we were doing for, for, you know, our fall festival kind of thing. And so I explained her we were doing a, a trunk or treat. And then I started to explain everything. And she goes, no, 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 just, you don't have to tell me what's going to be there. If your church is doing it for the kids, it's going to be really good. Come on, somebody. So I was, I was thankful for that. So everyone ate and they were full. Jesus will fill the hungry, the empty, the hurting with the bread of life. Now, I love what happens next. And this is the title of my message. It's time to pick up the leftovers. So the Bible says, in verse 12, he said, now gather the scraps, Jesus told his disciples, so that nothing is wasted. And 12 baskets were filled with the leftovers. Everybody say leftovers. Now say leftovers with a smile in your voice. There you go. It's possible because of tradition that every disciple received a basket of the leftovers. Among the Jews, there's a word called pia, which means residue. The pia is what is left over after a meal, and the pia becomes the property of those who serve the meal. So whatever is left belongs to the, would belong to the disciples. Whatever is left belongs to you if you're serving God. Somebody say amen. It reminds me of when the children were young and... I had a young friend named Judson Gardner. 
and um, so we had taken a big tub of ice cream over to their house for dinner. And so when it was time to leave, Carol, Carol went to the freezer, pulled that out and handed it to us. Judd was probably five or six. He comes running into the kitchen in utter despair. And he says, no, 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 Mom. You can't. You, they, they can't take the ice cream. She goes, you know the rule? So whenever you go and you take something to someone's house, you have to leave it there. Because, see, that's what, when she didn't want to bring something home, just like we did, she would send it away. So it's all yours. You get all of the leftovers, everything that no one else needs, but it's all a part of the same blessings that God gave to the multitudes. So, and it's really immaterial to me whether the disciples got it or not. Because the principles, I believe, of the leftovers are the same. The, the leftovers in this story prove an important, a couple of important principles. The first is God is a God of more than enough. Now, my wife will tell you that, and if you come, if you come to the family Christmas breakfast, you'll see it happen to me. You'll watch it on my face. I, I just turn into a nervous Nelly anytime we're feeding a lot of people. When we were young, I think I was probably 29 or 30, and we were having this big, huge dinner at the church. It was potluck, and everybody was supposed to bring something, and the church was providing the part of it. And the night before, I got so nervous we weren't going to have enough food that I brought home a 10-pound bag of potatoes and taught my wife into making 10 pounds of potatoes. What did I say? Potato salad. So I talked to her into making potato salad. So, she, my memory's not so good at 56. I want to think I helped you. I think you probably wouldn't have done that alone. Um, but so we get this made, and we had plenty of food. I promise you I brought home nine and a half pounds of potato salad. I do remember what she said to me when we tried to find room for it in the fridge. I said, well, we just need to, you know, can we throw some of this out? She goes, no, sir. You're going to eat every last pound of that potato salad. So what I want you to know is that our God is a God of more than enough. And he is, we're not just squeaking by, come on somebody. Our God is a God of more than enough. The second principle I believe is here is that God can take care of today and tomorrow. God can take care of today and tomorrow. So that's the lesson over the leftovers. Whether it went home with the disciples or they divvied it up between the 50 and that crowd and everybody got a little bit. They prove that our God is a God of more than enough. That he can take care of today and tomorrow. And so the third thing that proves is that God can take away the worry. God can take away the worry because we learn the principle that when it's desperate, that when it's difficult, when it's hard, and we don't know what's going to happen, God is always faithful. So we don't have to worry and we don't have to fret. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. How many of you know the Bible says that tomorrow has enough worries of its own? So you're not going to get you're not going to get any taller. But this same God who loves us, the same God who takes care of the birds and makes the flowers look beautiful is the same God who's able to take care of you. Listen, no matter what the devil tries to, to tell you, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you, your, your preacher said it the Sunday after Thanksgiving. So when the devil gets up in your face, you tell him that your God cares a whole lot more about you than he does the birds. And if he can take care of them, he'll take care of you. When he says you're going to lose it all and you're going to go bankrupt and it's all a mess and you're going to just, wheels are all going to got. I just want you to point at a bird. 
You could do it, you could do it like this. You could just point at a bird and say, devil, that's all I got to say about that. Come on, somebody. Because our God is a God of more than enough. The baskets full of leftovers remind us that God, what God can do when we think the situation is over. He fed 5,000 and he cared enough to take care of tomorrow and maybe the day after and the day after. We can count on that. Amen. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to give it up. I want you to put it in Jesus' hand. I want you to give in. That means I want you to obey and sit down and wait. Now, how many of you know, and I'm sure some of you drove your wives crazy. Is is dinner ready yet? Is dinner ready yet? Just watch the football game till it's over and we'll get to you. Just relax. Sometimes the, the waiting is difficult, but I want you to give in and obey the Lord. And if he says to sit and wait, I want you to sit and wait. And I think that's what we should do. Amen? And the third thing I want you to do is I want you to give it away. I want you to let God use you to bless others. I want the band to come and help me. It's apparent that if Jesus is there, if his willing followers are there, that I'm confident that Jesus, the bread of life, listen to me, will provide everything we need to meet the needs of our community with the blessing of leftovers to take care of his people. With the blessing to take care of his people. And so the, the principle is that we don't want to we don't want to hoard it, we don't want to hold on to it because we want to watch what God will do in our lives and in the lives of others. Can you say amen? Here's what here's what I'd like to do. I believe that there are those here who are struggling on a couple of levels. The first is this whole serving Jesus thing. The the bread of life, the one who satisfies, the one who cares for us, the one who gave his life for us. Some of you are not where you need to be with the Lord. 